What is the truth about the carnivore diet? Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman and welcome back to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional misinformation online. In this video, we're going to be watching an interview with Mark Sisson, who is one of the influential internet influencers to get paleo, primal, and keto really on the scene today. So it's a very interesting interview and I'll give my thoughts and final thoughts at the end of the video. So stay tuned till then. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Ancient Health Podcast. I'm so excited to actually interview somebody. Actually, it was one of my first interviews years ago, back, I want to say in 2009, Mark Sisson. And Mark Sisson is the visionary behind ancestral health. In fact, if you've heard the word primal regarding anything nutrition, Mark is the one that really sort of ran with that term and branded it and sort of brought into light primal eating along with the paleo diet. So part of the reason why the paleo diet is so popular is because of our guest today, Mark Sisson. And he's really transformed the way that we think about not only food, but in recent years, footwear. So Mark has dedicated a big part of his life to helping people live in tune with nature. And we're going to explore Mark's journey today, everything from overseeing anti-doping standards with triathletes to selling Primal Kitchen, incredible food-based, incredible food company that used, I said food-based company because it's one of the few food companies that actually uses real food. So, uh, but he was able to sell that company. So he's a successful entrepreneur, health enthusiast, and also a person who has, again, pioneered really the Primal and Paleo diets. Mark, welcome to the show. Well, I should first mention Dr. Josh Axe is also very popular and has been featured on the public broadcasting service, or PBS, and has foods or nutritional supplements and books and things like that, and is popular in, in his own right. And now to really, one of the main questions is, who do you listen to? You know, Dr. Axe is a chiropractor, I believe, a physician. You know, I, I look at chiropractors, osteopaths, physicians as similar training in terms of nutrition and, and background, while even MDs, the, you know, doctors like me, might not even get as much nutrition training as chiropractors or osteopaths, DOs. So, you know, I think if the information is interesting, credible, practical and useful and effective and healthy, I don't know that it matters where the source of information comes from, but now we're going to go a little further off into Mark Sisson is not a, any kind of physician at all, no medical training. So best I can tell, he has a biology degree and then comes to the keto, primal, paleo world through a very different means. It was his own personal triathlete sort of uh, uh, journey. So th this is a great way to introduce the idea of always consider the source of information where you're getting it from. If someone is talking about a program or the health effects of something and they're using it for something different than what you're trying to accomplish, then you have to be very aware of that. And of course, I'm very biased toward physicians who have a clinical practice of their own or used to have a clinical practice of their own because there are a lot of nuances and personalizations of general approaches that we can help people with. So uh, if you're one of my patients and you're not at a point where you're trying to you know, do a maintenance plan, you're still in the diabetes or obesity reversal phase, there's kind of two phases for most people who come to my office, then this is going to be something that you're going to want to kind of file away and look at further down the road. Or if you want to watch and listen to see what may be able to happen when you're at your goal, diabetes or whatever metabolic issue reversal, then this would apply then. But this is someone who's come from a very healthy, active lifestyle to a carb restricted or carb reduction sort of lifestyle. And you always have to consider that because someone's metabolism who has had a journey like that 
is probably very different than the metabolism of someone who has type 2 diabetes and obesity and you're having to be in a very strict phase in order to lose back down to where where Mark Sisson is, is now. So, but this is a, a great interview. The interviewer is popular in his own right and this is one of the leaders of the paleo primal movement as I see it. It's one of the low carb variations on a theme, if you will. And whether you do that through a, a carnivore diet or a ketoish diet, or even through a, a semi-vegetarian diet combined with, you know, intermittent fasting so that you do withhold carbohydrates for long periods of time and sort of stimulate the, the you know, the, all of those enzymes to take fat out of storage and burn them. Um, however you get to that point of metabolic flexibility, that's really what I want for everybody. So then once you're there, you can sort of intuitively consume what makes you feel good and what you know will serve you in the moment rather than having to, you know, choose not to go to this restaurant, even though everyone else is going because they don't have something on the menu that I can eat or, you know, deciding that you're not going to fill your refrigerator up with these things because there's no way you're ever going to eat those. I, I try to be as inclusive as possible with my diet. Now I like to eat. I mean, I'm, I want to enjoy life at the end of the road. At, at, at everything we talk about in this world that has to do with this realm of ancestral health still comes back to how do you feel and are you pleased with your life? Are you extracting the greatest amount of enjoyment, contentment, fulfillment out of every possible moment? And so I, I find that some people get so in the weeds about the dogma of I've chosen to eat this way and I have to eat this way. And even though it's a sacrifice and I don't exactly like what I eat sometimes, I'm doing it for, you know, the long haul. I'm, 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 I'm kind of over that. So that's kind of been a shift in my life. I'd rather. Well, I, I'm going to stop right there because there are some things he said already that clash with perhaps your experience. If you've had a weight loss journey, you've reversed type two diabetes, you may be addicted to the sugar and starches get digested to sugar. So you may be addicted. When I say addicted to sugar, it means you might be addicted to potatoes, pasta, rice, fruit, bread is a big one, especially if you've been making the addictive substance through the years, all of those conditioned cues of, of kneading the dough and smelling it and all that, that that's going to be tough to break. And so remember, consider where Mark has come from, a rather healthy lifestyle, being a triathlete. He, well, and kind of like me, I came to this because two of my patients lost over 50 pounds each. And I thought this was real remarkable. It never really happened before in my clinic. This was 1998 as I was an internal medicine specialist at the Durham VA Medical Center. And so I took note of that, but, but my own experience is, is kind of like Mark's where I can add in things every now and then and not get tugged back to the addictive substance that, that gets me out of control. So remember, careful with your own experience with someone else's experience. If you've found, like many of my patients have found, that if they reintroduce the Christmas cookies, the, the Thanksgiving eating, the, they can get sucked back into the carbohydrates and regain all of the weight that they've lost throughout that year, regained all of that weight over that holiday season because you're really not in control if you're an addict. And so the, the, again, consider the source. And now if you have kind of the background of Mark or, or me, I had 20 or 30 pounds to, to lose, not, not a whole lot. And I didn't have a diabetes problem personally. I can reincorporate bread or pasta or rice occasionally, but you know, I've learned to, to do it less, much less often than before. And then I don't always eat everything that's given to me. In fact, if I go to a uh, one of these uh, buffets or, or Japanese steak houses where they pile on rice. I, I'm just kind of shocked at how much people eat now. Uh, have you noticed just uh, it, it, there's no break for the stopping the consumption of that if you have that kind of metabolism. So I like the idea that you don't want to be feeling that you're having to do this forever. But if you're on your, your weight maintenance or, or, or excuse me, weight loss or diabetes reversal or metabolic uh, syndrome reversal 
journey this path and you want to be super strict but knowing that one day you'll be able to reincorporate things but maybe not to the degree that that mark's talking about here because his journey is different rather make sure that everybody's enjoying now with a reason well and i like the enjoyment that the when i got into this dr atkins was still alive 1998 and I would see him on TV showing steak and eggs and bacon and filet mignon and saying, you don't have to suffer. You don't have to eat rice cakes. And, and so that still applies today. You can, you can eat on a low carb diet and lose weight and, or maintain the weight eating fabulous foods. Of course, you have to be super strict. Some people have to be super strict about limiting the sugars and starches while you do that. So you shift the type of food that you're eating. But it still can be glorious. And, and I agree, you, you ought to be eating foods that you like. A lot of the work I do in the clinic is reminding people that there are lots of different foods that don't have carbs that they may have never even tried before. And occasionally I'll, I'll joke about getting that old Dr. Seuss book, The Green Eggs and Ham, and where at the end of the book, actually, he liked the green eggs and ham. He just never tried it before. So I agree that, you know, life is short. You want to enjoy life and eating a low carb lifestyle can be just fantastic. Yes, you might have to give up for a while the things that you grew up with. And, and, but when you think about it, it's difficult to make a change if you don't change something. And of course, we're talking about foods. And, and healthy foods, ways to lose weight, reverse diabetes here. Make sure that everybody's enjoying now, within reason, obviously within this list yeah. of things that you can eat, and obviously there's a list of things that you should not eat. But but you know I'm I'm much more accepting of some of the you know some of the f falling off the wagon, if you will, that some people engage in. Yeah. I remember going to your website years ago and you had a food list on there. And I remember you, you were one of the, now Lorraine Cordain was the first for me. I remember reading his book. I was doing triathlons at the time. And so I think I read the paleo diet for athletes. And I remember reading that book. Actually, this brings me to another question I'm curious about. I remember when I read that book, one of the things that I generally disagreed with, which, which dietarily, again, I, I thought it was a brilliant book, really, really brilliant book. But he recommended essentially eating no salt. Did you, do, you, do you recall this? Or yes, like, of course. So it, that, was a, that was another example. Yes, yes. Okay. So, so I, as a triathlete, I, I realized very quickly that was not going to work for me. No. You know? So again, consider the source. I, I don't know much about Dr. Josh Axe other than the name and, and the presence on media. And he's very popular, but he comes to this apparently his own personal life from being a triathlete. Now, I think he has clinical experience with other diseases and all. I'm not exactly sure though. Uh, let me know if you tell me in the notes, comments below. But remember, the uh, if someone's going to give you the advice from their own personal life, then you're going to want to consider what their background was. So the, both of these people, Dr. Axe and Mark Sisson, were triathletes which, you know, unless they had a massive weight loss before that, I don't think they did. They were trying to optimize. And, and the first time I heard the term run on fat for fuel was actually from the elite athletes who kind of shifted in their minds. Well, I'm, they're just changing the fuel source. I was taught by the, the doctors who were reversing diabetes and all this. And the idea of running on fat was, was kind of against the rules that I mean, you wouldn't eat fat and run on fat. So the athletes started using that language. I started picking up on it as well. And the idea of paleo and primal as methods of eating fats and burning fats uh, you may not really think of that much and that's fine. You know, we have different brands of cars and, and different names and, and, you know, when you're on there, that one car lot, they're not going to talk about any other kind of car. Keep that in mind. So if someone's promoting a book or a, or a, a way of thinking, then they're not going to really talk about other ways of doing it. But back to the idea of salt. Yeah. Th that's one of the big differences. Once you're eating fat, you're limiting carbs. You don't want to limit salt anymore. Although if you're in the clinic, 
So if you're, if you're on diabetes, blood pressure medicines, and you're in that clinical realm of seeing doctors and all that, you do want to be careful about having salt. If you're not in that area, you don't have high blood pressure, you don't have kidney failure or, or liver failure or heart failure, then you don't want to limit salt. You want to add salt. I think the rule of thumb is something between five and seven grams of salt a day. And you might have to add in bullion or some other electrolyte sup supplement. My idea is to just teach people the foods to eat. And if they have any symptom of electrolyte problem, like muscle cramps, weakness, fatigue, that sort of thing, then I advise adding in the salt or the sodium or the magnesium. There are other ways to get these electrolytes and just have them every day. So you don't, definitely don't want to fear salt or sodium, even if you're on those blood pressure medicines, but you don't want to add in, unless of course you're measuring the blood pressure at home, which I'm a big fan of. So if you're monitoring the heart failure, the, the kidney failure, the, the blood pressure, it's okay to change the salt as long as you're monitoring it and then let your doctor know. So in my office, I have those kind of warnings or certain situations where you don't want to add salt. Remember, we're talking to two people who got into this because of the marathon or triathlete, you know, just high functioning exercise. And there, of course, you wouldn't limit sodium because you're sweating so much and losing salt in that sweat. And then I started noticing too, I'm like, wow, I really am tired if I have one bite or just a little bit of too much fruit. But then there were certain things like potatoes. I thought that, hey, that's going to really cause me to jump up and they didn't. But then I noticed with some other people, you know, they did better yeah. with a little bit more fruit. If they did potatoes or, or rice, you know, I, I tended to do pretty well with 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 rice and potatoes. So anyways, it's pretty interesting. But I don't know, have you have you ever done a glucose monitor and see how no, your body responds? You know, to the, the CGM thing is very interesting to me, but I don't know if you've heard, but I am like the anti quantified self. I don't okay. I don't I don't like much of the data. And I think uh, you know my my line is bad data is worse uh, no, uh, bad data is worse than no data. <laughs> well, so now I'm getting to like Mark Sisson even more because I don't personally nor recommend that you quantify the quantified self is where you're measuring everything you can you know your blood pressure your your sleep with a ring your blood glucose your blood ketones and because like mark is saying we really don't know what all of the data means so bad data is worse than moderately good data i've even seen some people worry about their their measurements when they shouldn't be worrying about the measurements and so having them stop the, the cgm is a continuous glucose monitor having them stop that worrying and and stop that measuring leads to less worrying about it so getting comfortable with a set of foods you know again that banter about adding potatoes and rice and all is in the context of someone who's not trying to be ketogenic or you know being a keto level which is prescription strength carbohydrate restriction and that's the maximal fat burning you want to be very careful about adding those in if you're in that weight loss or diabetes or metabolic problem reversal phase in many cases i always come back to how do you feel so i know how i feel that's after good. i've eaten certain foods i know how i feel if i've had you know too much alcohol i know how i feel if i haven't had enough sleep or if i overtrain and all of these things there are devices that i could wear that would tell me that I didn't sleep well, or that my HRV was was inappropriate for training today. So not everyone has that personal experience, right? Again, we're, we're listening to one man's body, the sensations. I have met a lot of people who have no clue really how they feel. And, and I have to think that it's, you become sort of numb to a lot of the feelings and, and the idea that carbohydrates kind of dump, uh, numb things and, and you know give you insulin resistance and, and all that. I, it, it's kind of puts it all together that you're, it's harder for you to detect when you're truly hungry or, you know, and if you're tired all the time, you're not going to know the effect of a certain food and whether it's making you tired or not, because you're, you're just tired all the time. So we're watching someone who is able to feel a certain way and detect it and thinks it's sufficient. I, I would have to say that, well, blood pressure and often blood sugar abnormalities, even when they're medically concerning, like 
high blood pressure and diabetes can be asymptomatic, meaning it's, you might not feel that for a while. So, but again, we're listening to pretty high functioning people who are in tune with their bodies. But I have had enough occasions to wear these things and find out, you know, I actually did sleep pretty well last night, despite what, you know, despite what my ring said or what my bed told me. I did have a great workout today, despite the fact that my HRV was, you know, was saying it was not appropriate. The so HRV is the heart rate variability. So the, the idea that these indicators would tell you how you feel, I, I've seen that happen where someone is feeling great and, that, and then a number like A1C, hemoglobin A1C, a measure of blood sugar or, or a cholesterol measurement is done and then they, they feel terrible. I mean, they, meaning they are anxious or depressed or not physical feeling, but mental feeling. So I, I, I personally agree that you don't have to measure those things. I don't personally. Or the converse, right? They said, go, go train your ass off. And then I did, and, you know, it got, um, and got winded and got, got gassed. So I always come back to how do you feel? How do you feel in your life? How do you feel in your genes? How do your genes fit? How do your, you know, what's your energy level when you wake up in the morning? Do you wake up without an alarm clock? How do you feel when you, you know, you're out in the sun and you've, you know, you've cut back on seed oils and I can spend an hour and a half in the sun without burning? Oh. <laughs> well, that reminded me. So the, the words being translated there, the gene came out wrong, right? How your genes fit. G-E-N-E, we meant J-E-A-N-E, reminded me of the saying that Mark Twain had, which was careful of a book written by a doctor because you don't want to die of a misprint, meaning it might be, you know, written as milligrams or, or and it should have been micrograms of a dose of something. So interesting that, you know, consider the source. I know a lot of people who just are unable to have that sort of self-awareness in their certain state. Now, if you get on a healthy eating program, healthy lifestyle, and, and really what I teach at first is just diet change. It's really no exercise needed. So you start feeling better as time goes on. The body has a pretty amazing way of self re-educating. And although get a coach, get someone who can help you at first get started. But this is again, kind of a, when you're down and you're near your goal, these are the conversations I have in my office. What are you going to do for the long run? Are you really going to follow an internet influencer who says check ketones all the time? Are you really going to do that forever? Well, you can, but I, I wanted to teach a program where you don't have to worry about much at all and you eat great foods and you go out and do other things. That, that's my, my goal for you. All of these things are available if, if for anybody to sort of play with without needing a device, you know, to tell them. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had, you know, I've, I've been to dinner with friends who say, you know, well, it's 10 o'clock, but I'm, I, I can't go home now. I have to walk another 3,000 steps to get my 20,000 for the day. I'm like, yeah. uh, you're just sort of missing the whole point here of, of enjoying life. And in this case, enjoying a night out on the town with friends. Yeah, you know, I, I, I do think what you're sharing in terms of this sort of physiological awareness, you know, you, you, people are aware of their own body, they're aware of how food affects them, you know, I, I, and just, so you know, I generally agree with you on on what you're saying. I mean, I, I definitely lean more towards what you're sharing. I think that, you know, and I think it depends on the person. I think for some people, I had a buddy tell me this the other day, he was a guy I work out with. And, and I said, Hey, are you still wearing this, this device he was wearing? He goes, no, it was stressing me out. He said, I was getting yes, less sleep yes. and I was more. And, and there probably are a significant amount of people that feel that way. But I also do know, like for myself, if I eat too many egg, you know, if I eat too many eggs, uh, my nose starts running. If I eat dairy, I get phlegm in my throat, right? Um, I do well with almost everything else, but there are certain things I know I feel tired, I feel run down, I don't respond to. So I do think for everyone listening, I do think there's so much wisdom, Mark, in what you're sharing here. And yeah, well, again, the variability, that ability to sense how you feel and what things you eat, how they make you feel, the idea that dairy gives you phlegm or, or the reduction or elimination of seed oils allows you to go in the sun without getting burnt. Those aren't common things that I see in my office. I think just because I limit the, those 
foods that contain dairy or, or seed oils to a degree that people don't get those sort of problems. But I, I wanted to pick up on one of the things I've, I've learned being in a clinical practice and, and listening to my patients really has changed how I practice. Uh, there were people who would come in saying a certain food makes them sick or, or makes them hurt. And, you know, my general doctor training would be, well, you know, unless you really need that food or do that activity or, you know, doc, it hurts when I put my arm up in this weird contortion, you would just generally say, well, don't do that. And so I've met people now with several, and, and that's what, from a, a clinic, I require need or, or want to have two or three or four or five signals of the same thing before I'll start saying, well, this is probably generalizable to more than one human, right? You might have a case study or it might affect one person in a certain way. I don't start saying, well, everyone should behave that way. I have a list of foods and I say, choose what you like from that list. Again, with that idea of liking what you eat. So recently, several people have told me that eating plants makes their stomach hurt. And, you know, they go to doctors and dietitians and they're told they have to eat plants. They have to eat vegetables. They have to eat leafy greens and vegetables. And in my initial teaching, I have that on that first list of foods as you can. It's not required. And I'm not sure if you need them every day, but every now and then I think greens and vegetables have nutrition that, that's helpful. But some people came into me and said eating plants hurts. Now, I wouldn't have been in tune to that until I had had patients and other doctors now treating people with diets that don't have many plants at all, or maybe no plants at all. And this kind of dietary approach is turning around very difficult problems that doctors are having trouble fixing. So I think if you are, you know, unless you're someone who paints it yourself into the corner or everything hurts, you know, if, if you have an ulcer or a gastritis, then everything is going to hurt. That's a different situation. But if, if you found that a certain food, you don't like it or tolerate it, generally you, you've erased that in your childhood. You know, if you had, you know, didn't like to have green peppers, you probably have avoided that. And now as an adult, you're not eating much of that unless... You go to a program that says you have to have those, but I respect that if you choose what you like and what you can tolerate from that list of foods, and you might even be noticing things that other people don't talk about, like a certain food hurting or not making uh, you feel well. But sometimes it's hard to figure that out. The, the delay in the feeling can be make it difficult to sleuth out what the culprit was yesterday or the day before. So if I'm asking someone to do a kind of elimination of a certain food as a detective, that I would ask you to eliminate it for, and to stay away from it for about a week to see if that was the culprit that causing whatever problem it was. And, and I like Dr. Like Mark Sisson, he's not a doctor. I'm more lenient or allowing for, you know, you don't have to be so super strict if you're not an addict and it will make you fall off and get sucked back into carbs. So I like the, the, this kind of conversation. Again, if you're near or at your maintenance, how are you going to live life in the long run? That is become more aware. I mean, by the way, awareness is important for you and I would probably agree with this with everything, spiritual awareness of the greatest mystics and spiritual gurus of all time were incredibly aware of certain things. People that have the most emotional intelligence, they're incredibly self-aware and aware of the feelings of others. And so I think the same thing goes for our physical health. If we can be incredibly aware as you're sharing, it's, it's important. And by the way, I do want to say this with medical tests. One of the most inaccurate medical tests I've ever used are food sensitivities and food allergy oh. tests. I mean, yes. it is unbelievable how many people I use that with over the years. And then you test the differing results, including myself. And so to your point, there definitely are some incredibly inaccurate tests. But I mean, there's a, there's a great example, Josh, because I just had my, my wife is into this stuff and, and, you know, God bless her. Cause I love the fact she's into exploring and finding new ways to address, you know, our, our lives. Um, and she just did one of those very complex uh, food sensitive sensitivity tests. And so she had me do it as well. 
And, you know, I, it comes back and I have, you know, a, a wheat, a gluten issue. I would have, I could have told you that. I'm I laugh because th this is my experience as well. People will be seeking information. You go to a doctor or practitioner who recommends all of these different blood tests and you might even have urine tests. You might have a hair test sent off. And at the end of the day, if you're told you have gluten sensitivity, you're told not to have gluten. Well, I ask people not to have gluten right away. And so if you have different food sensitivities, the idea is to avoid those. And the, the accuracy is, I think, problematic, especially if, if you're testing, you know, a hundred different things, something is going to be abnormal, even if you're in the normal range, just to st statistically. And so the idea of asking someone else to tell you what you're sensitive to, the most common things would be, you know, the, the gluten, the preservatives and the uh, artificial dyes, which typically aren't tested there. But the food, interestingly, the test might be you have a problem with potatoes and the idea on a low carb diet is you don't have potatoes so if the test is you shouldn't have certain nightshade vegetables well those nightshade vegetables like potatoes eggplant are, are limited you know to very low amounts if at all on a program that's keto or very low in carbohydrates that limits itself to non-starchy vegetables. So I found that I don't need to teach people or, or tell them to go get sensitivity testing. I just teach them a program that eliminates almost all of those different sensitivities. I've even had people come to me who are allergic to the meats, the, the, the shellfish, the eggs, the you know, oh, I can't eat eggs. And then over time, when you cut the carbohydrates out, you're more tolerant of the foods that you weren't able to eat before. Remember, there's a lot that changes when you cut carbohydrates out and you eat mainly proteins and fats. A lot of the digestive enzymes change, the, the enzymes in your, your cells change, and the, your ability to tolerate different foods changes as well. Along these lines, there is a interesting and, and actually quite serious problem of meat eating if you've been bitten by the Lone Star Tick and have something called alpha-gal allergy. If you've heard of that, if you've heard of it, you probably have had it, which is too bad because it's often difficult to diagnose. And it does mean that you can't eat mammalian meat for a while, often for a period of years. So the Lone Star Tick is out there in here in the southeast United States. And you'll get the story of someone coming to the emergency room with hives or even anaphylaxis, which means the throat can close. You feel like you're on death's door. You go in, you have to get emergency therapy. And it can be difficult to diagnose because you don't put two and two together that the, the tick might a tick bite might have been a week or two before and often you don't even know that you had the tick bite. So the way to kind of heightened awareness is if you're having hives, throat closing, anaphylactic shock, which you have to go to the emergency room to get treated for, and then you end up in an allergist's office, often they'll figure it out because they're in tune to this, but most doctors don't really know about it. And it's the eating of meat but if you're eating meat, you know, very frequently, you won't put that two and two together. So I've had someone who didn't eat meat very frequently. So that every time that happened, she ended up having to go to the emergency room, got diagnosed with alpha-gal. Alpha-gal is a blood test. It's simple to diagnose if you know what test to check. And then you can check the level of your sensitivity over time. And the good news is, most people have a, a couple of years where they have to stay away from it and from mammalian meat, meaning no, no red meat, no steak and no hamburger. Uh, but then it fades away for most people over time. But that, that's an unusual kind of thing. But still, you want to know what you're sensitive to, what you're not. But getting back to the blood testing for sensitivities, it's, it can be all over the board. And it would be a shame if you 
had a blood test that told you you were allergic to all these different things and so you ended up eating things you didn't like you didn't accomplish your metabolic goals so be sure to require or insist upon improvements that's the other interesting thing if you go to a doctor that just measures things and doesn't fix things find a different doctor i mean so doctors who are trained in effective management and reversal of these things need results and so they gravitate toward programs that really do work uh, so i've seen people go to doctors who just measure things and then don't know how to fix it uh, they don't get you the results that that you deserve yeah yeah you, you know i, I think I think so go, going back to the the topic of nutrition, I think this is somebody something people are would be interested to hear 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 from you on, based on you being so aware. As I mentioned, I think there's a lot to be said about being self aware and being aware. I know you've also you know worked and consulted a lot of clients over the years in their health and nutrition. You know, what do you think some of the most important foods are we should be trying to get in our diet? What are some surprise foods that maybe, again, if new listeners are new to you saying, okay, this is a food that will really impact your health in a positive way. And then I want you to go to the other side there too, or you <laughs> could start with this if you want of, yeah. hey, what are some of those foods that are even being promoted in health food stores? And some doctors are out there promoting today that absolutely are going to start, are going to affect your health negatively. You know, I, I, I guess I'd start with the things that I would not eat. Um, you yeah. know, we've made a big deal of industrial seed oils over the past several years and and how they might be worse than sugar for a lot of people. Hey, uh, but, but are, by the way, please point this out for everybody. Sunflower oil is in everything. And yes. so, so, so is safflower oil. What are your thoughts on those? I still have not seen anything positive on sunflower or safflower, even high oleic, which some people seem to think is a uh, you know as a reasonable compromise in those oils you know so i've been i've been on that bandwagon about just like eliminate canola and and that's another thing like it to this day i think whole foods still like serves up a lot of canola oil in some of their dressings and stuff like that and even though they should know better the problem is it's just so it's so cheap compared to the healthier oils right well i'm a little disappointed i would have said you want to limit sugar and maybe Mark is assuming everyone know, got that memo already. And he's already going down the rabbit hole of uh, seed oils, industrial seed oils, which, you know, it's hard to change the whole system all at once. So in my approach, we don't worry about it. We just limit it. We limit it to a degree that there, you're not going to get much if you get some at all. And, and it's a distraction that makes a lot of people having a, a good eating pattern being un unobtainable. I mean, if you, if you say you can't have store-bought salad dressing because of a, a very small amount of this in a program that limits the carbohydrates and the sugars, which I wish he'd said sugar first, the, you don't have to worry about getting store-bought stuff because the amount of it is so low. So I, that, that was a little surprising to me. The avocado oil, the extra virgin olive oil, uh, coconut oil, obviously. And so uh, most of my patients cannot afford those types of oils. So it, again, you want to balance, uh, you know, are you trying to attain perfection? I mean, you know, at all costs. Or are you trying to do the best you can, the progress, not perfection? And I have to meet people where they are in terms of availability of foods, the, the costs, the, and get success at the same time, which is the difference between an influencer who can just tell you, here's what you do, and someone who's in an office in a clinic that has to deal with a wide variety of different parameters and lifestyles. So I would say getting rid of the industrial seed oils is is an important first step for a lot of people getting rid of the sugars the added sugars and the refined grains so those are the things that i would say the you know as i said for the longest time the less sugar you consume in a lifetime probably the better off you are okay so you did say the sugar and refined grains yay but i would have spent the whole time talking about that rather than the seed oils so uh, if you're one of my patients you won't even have had this register on your radar because I really don't talk about it in the clinic. The teaching of a low-carb diet 
through the years and paleo primal and it really have been hunter gatherer these kinds of lifestyles uh, didn't have to worry much about industrial seed oils because they didn't exist and even now if you're eating mainly real foods from the outside of the grocery stores I, I think I'm, I'm one of those outliers in the keto world where I don't think that those are a big issue and the, the burden of proof should be on the people who say the industrial seed oils are a big issue. And, and, I, and I don't mean association studies. Remember, association is not causation. And I think there needs to be a more certain evaluation and proving that that kind of stuff is bad rather than all automatically assuming that it's bad and fear-mongering about it. I've had people eat at McDonald's and, and Wendy's and Burger King and have store-bought food, food available at any grocery store, and they still have great success in diabetes or other metabolic issue reversal and maintenance. To, of course, they're limiting the quantities of those things, and the uh, idea of limiting sugar and all, but now I'm getting back. We didn't hear what the best foods are yet, have we? <laughs> so uh, let's see if they talk about that. To try to reduce that, what would I add? I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of beef. I mean, I think regenerative ag is the way to save the world. It's a way to feed the world. It's a way to generate more topsoil. It's a way to sequester more carbon. It is the answer to everyone's current nightmare, whether it's, yep. you know, climate change or, or depopulation or starving countries or just the malnutrition within the overfed American society. So I'm a huge fan of beef, right? So I think animal protein is still the ideal human food has been for millions of years. Beyond that, I would say some amount of, of green leafy vegetables, almost more for the variety and the crunch and the whatever. I don't think if, I think if you're, have, have eliminated a lot of the stuff, the, the refined grains, the starches, the, you know, the, the, the sugary sweetened beverages and the industrial seed oils, then you also, your requirement, the requirement of the body for added minerals and added vitamins goes way down, right? Mm. The original RDAs were based in the 1940s, based on a, a diet that was large and had a lot of grain in it, a lot of, a lot of cheap sources of calories, which leached minerals out of the body. So you had to like add more minerals back in to maintain bone density or maintain, you know, mm -hmm. calcium channel functionality. I think if you have a meat centric diet or, a, or an animal protein centric diet, you don't need a lot of other stuff. Then yeah, I totally agree. So I'm less worried about your nutrition if you're eating mainly animal source products, animal source foods. I guess I would expand the meat to poultry, fish and shellfish and eggs. I, I think the fine tuning or the nuance of the differences of these proteins is pretty small. And if you eat from a variety of meat, poultry, fish and shellfish and eggs, you're gonna get the nutrition that you need. A little bit of leafy greens and vegetables is, is sort of, it's what we teach. And, you know, I kind of hedge my bet on whether we know everything about nutrition, because even in the last years, we've found new types of vitamins and new elements in the food that is important and even essential for human health. So I think um, the idea of ancestral eating, the old saying was don't blame a, a new disease for an old food from for uh, don't blame an old food for a new the saying goes don't blame an old food for a new disease and eating animals and animal source products have been around a long time. Had a discussion with a young fellow in my clinic where he w had done a vegan diet for a long time. And, and I just asked him, you know, well, how long has a vegan diet been around? And, and you know, he didn't know. Best I could tell from sleuthing on the internet, the, the term vegan was created in the 1940s. That's pretty new in terms of ancestral health, paleo, primal, hunter-gatherer, doing a real food-based kind of, kind of diet with animal products included. So that if you're just using the test of time, a vegan diet's only been around a very short period of time. The idea of regenerative agriculture uh, saving the planet is, you know, it's a, a great statement. And the detail, I think, is going to be more complicated. But if you have concerns about ethical treatment of animals, 
One way you can change that is by eating locally, eating from places that have regenerative or humane treatment of agriculture and, and regenerative meaning the, the, you have a kind of swapping of different animals on the same soil so that it replenishes the soil. It doesn't take away topsoil. I think this is a complicated issue that's oversimplified by a lot of people who would have you not eat meat for other purposes, for, for religious or ethical purposes. But even then, you may, if you use eggs as your main source, that might be ethically more consistent with your values. Uh, the, there are a lot of different ways to go about this nutritionally. So I would rather treat the human here and make sure that they're surviving and, and of course, making sure the planet survives as well, but there's a quick sort of elimination of the importance of topsoil, as you heard. And there was a wonderful movie, uh, The Biggest Little Farm, I think it was called, where these people turned this very like dry and dead soil into living topsoil again using animals and you know, animal manure is a big source of the ability to have topsoil. So I don't think we've fully worked out the detail of how to save the planet, changing the food and, and the diet. And, but I agree that this type of approach seems promising. But I didn't, you know, I, I felt like maybe there's, maybe there's a, a, an amount of food that's less than I'm consuming that is still optimal for me, still maintain muscle mass, still grow muscle, still, have all the energy I want all day, still not get sick, and still you know, not be hungry, not be tethered to hunger and appetite and cravings. So if I meet, if I make meat and the satiety of protein the centerpiece of my diet, knowing that protein is critical to anybody my age, anybody over 50 for that matter, I'm 70 now, so I, I want to maintain muscle mass. Once I've dialed that in, then I just sort of layer on things that I that from a list of you know, great possibilities that I feel like eating in the moment, whether it's salad, whether it's broccoli, whether it's, you know, Brussels sprouts, whether it's a sweet potato with, uh, you know, with butter on it and a lot of salt, you know, it's, it's, you know, that's, those are, the, those are the types of what I would say, those are the comfort foods and those are the superfoods. You know, if you go outside there and say, well, you should be eating acai and mangosteen and, you know, aloe and all the, you know, all of the MLM products from years ago. No, there's no real superfood here. And kale. I, I hate kale. I <laughs> yeah, I don't like kale either, or arugula. Or, you know, so, I, well, I like the style. Remember the source, that Mark is able to be metabolically flexible. I mentioned that we would talk about that at some point. Metabolic flexibility is the ability to burn carbs, burn fats, to go back and forth, to not develop a metabolic disease like diabetes or prediabetes. These are all going down that pathway that you don't want to go down. So metabolic flexibility, children are very metabolically uh, flexible. A child might even not have uh, food for half a day and have ketones in the urine because they've started to burn their body fat. So someone with diabetes has a very difficult time burning body fat. Someone with diabetes is in the sugar burning mode, even their body is making more sugar for the body to, to metabolize and it's stuck in that. So you want to get out of the sugar burning mode and into the fat burning mode. And the flexibility is, you know, if you need the sugar, you're able to get to it. If you are not needing sugar, you're running mainly on fat. That's just fine too. So it, is the theory goes that if you are metabolically flexible and you haven't gotten into a lifestyle that destroys that, that you won't develop diabetes or, or obesity because you are able to draw upon the fat. That's what Mark said in his first video is that he wants people to be able to draw upon the fat when, when you can or when it's appropriate, which probably is most of the time. I, I'm coming full circle to not only should you be metabolically flexible, but you should be able to burn fat pretty much all the time and occasionally burn sugar and you burn what you eat. So if you want to turn off fat burning, eat sugar, meaning starches as well, because starches get digested to sugar. So if you want to turn off fat burning and store fat, eat carbs, 
basically. And that's the, the metabolic summary, basically, of how our bodies work. We, we burn what we eat. And if you want to lose weight, you don't want to burn carbs. You want to burn fat off your body. The way to become a fat burner is just to not eat many carbs. And the level I take people to in my clinic is 20 to 30 total carbs per day with medical supervision to get people off medications safely. But he said something. It was the first time I'd heard anybody get into this when it comes to a carnivore diet is he said, you know, my research, and he said, I actually did a study on this. And, and uh, if you're going only meat and that's all you're doing, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be too much acid. And, and so what it might do is, according to him, it might start pulling some of the minerals out of your bones and your fascia and connective tissue. And that was really the first time I'd heard that. And I think that, you know, I think that when it comes to any diet, there are some positives and negatives. And this is why, again, this self-awareness thing is so big. Figuring out your own body, what's working for you, what do you tolerate well, is really, really, really important. Now, I, I'm a huge fan of eating a lot of meat. I mean, I probably try and get 40 grams per meal or so. But but what, what are your thoughts overall? On, on, and specifically, I want to ask you a question. Feel free to share any thoughts on what I just yeah. shared. But also... You know, do you eat organ meats? That'd be another another question so, I have for you. Yeah, and, and, and I do, but I don't eat enough. And so when you talk about carnivore, I would say that one of the things that you got to put an asterisk in front of carnivore is do you eat enough nose to tail? Because if you're mm. eating just the choice cuts of meat, that's probably not enough nutrition for you. And that's probably prompting the body to, to you know, to, to go toward that, for lack of a better term, I don't like the term, but acidic route where it, where it tends to be, you know, net negative on the mineralization. But if you're eating nose to tail, if you're, if you're consuming organ meats, if you're consuming the, uh, the bone, you know, bone broth and the, and the collagenous parts of the animal, which are contributing to your connective tissue, then I think you're probably better off. Well, I think there's a lot known about carnivore eating, and there's a lot not known about carnivore eating and how you define carnivore changes, who you talk to. You know, for example, lions and wolves don't drink coffee. So some people even say you can't have coffee on a carnivore diet. Some are more lenient. Some are more like Mark in having vegetables every now and then. But I asked a carnivore proponent to write a scholarly paper about whether it was sufficient in nutrients. And the idea of acidity didn't really come up in that paper. But the idea of getting all the nutrients that you need was, was pretty satisfied in my mind, uh, although there may be some areas where if you compare it to the requirements or, or recommendations that people make, it might not fall into that. For example, the, the carbohydrates are told, recommended that you have 30 to 40 percent of your diet as carbohydrates. So my teaching violates that recommendation because I don't want people to have 30 to 40 percent carbs. So even some of the recommendations are very narrowly focused on, on one way of looking at things. And there are other ways to be healthy and, and you don't always have to follow these guidelines or fall into that. You want to make sure that whatever you're doing is giving you the health that you want. Although it's hard to know for some things, like they're, they're talking about long-term issues, about bone mineralization, although you can get tests to look at your bones. And, and so if you're following a kind of radically different approach and you feel well, otherwise there are some tests you might want to throw in if you had a family history of osteoporosis, for example. I wouldn't say don't do a diet like a carnivore diet. I'd say, well, then measure what you can about it. This is true for anyone coming to a low carb diet who chooses to do that for a lifetime or a long period of time. Measure the things that are important. And I, I don't really focus on the, all the blood measurements so much anymore. If, if your doctor is worried about cholesterol, remember cholesterol is not a disease. Cholesterol may contribute to vascular disease. So you want to test your vascular system rather than just take someone's opinion or you have a risk for something. You don't want to be treated for a disease to prevent a disease that you would never get in the first place. There are 
people who don't get atherosclerosis, even though they live in the US, the doctors assume that everyone is going to get atherosclerosis. And so they treat a blood test because it is a predictor of it when it may not be a predictor for you if you weren't going to get the problem ever, even in the first place. So the carnivore diet is a variation, remember, of a low carbohydrate diet. It's not so far off the, the radar here, and it does keep the carbs really low. Not everyone is in ketosis, although some people are in ketosis, which is just fine. It just means you're burning fat. Remember, everyone goes into ketosis after two days of not eating anything. It's a, it's a normal condition to be in when you don't have access to food. It doesn't make sense to me that we would be putting ourselves in a toxic state if we didn't have access to food. If anything, we would be in a, a kind of safe mode, like a computer. If we didn't have food around, we would be more efficient with utilizing things. But that's a conjecture. But it, it's one that occurred to me only after 20 years of looking at people on low carb, even keto diets, even carnivore diets. Although I, I'm uh, exhorting the carnivore folks to <laughs> get research going and do publications so that we have a more systematic view of what happens to everyone who chooses to follow that pattern. It, it might even be a disease reversal diet for a lot of people like it has been anecdotally for some people. I spent 20 years educating people on ways in which the body works and how the world works and how food is supposed to work as a, you know, as, as a source of energy, but as, as a source of pleasure. And I've, I've brought people onto my side as you have, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time too. And, and, but it takes, it takes a lot of cajoling and a lot of educating and a lot of people, you know, resisting before they say, Oh, yeah, I've seen this guy a couple times. I've read some of his stuff. You know, it's starting to make sense. But, you know, I have friends who I've been talking about weight loss and improving their lives for 20 years. And then, and then my book comes out and all of a sudden it gets some good reviews and they start, you know, incorporating some of the ideas in my book. And they go, oh my God, Mark, this is amazing. I'm like, well, I've been telling you this for 20 years, but, you know, finally there's, some, I guess, writing a book has some, you know, level of credibility added to otherwise the, the sort of uh, throwaway advice that I've been giving you for, for the last 20 years. It's tough. I mean, people, look, people don't want to change that much. They don't want to invest so much with, if there's the possibility of failure, right? If, if they yeah. knew that this was going to work, I think they'd embrace it. But so many times people have been let down by the wrong information, by the wrong products, by the wrong, you know, medical information, you know, for the longest time, you avoid butter, right? You stay away from butter. It's horrible for you. And oleo and margarine is the best way to go. And then the next thing you know, it flips completely on its ass. And that's right. Now you, it's, 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 I would, I'm, I'm very fortunate and I have tremendous gratitude for my having spent the amount of time I did educating myself because I know, you know, I feel so content in how I view this world from the prism, from the perspective that I have, having spent that time learning about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think there's a level of, you know, character involved. I think there's a level of work ethic. I think it's harder to, you know, you'd mentioned sort of giving it over the machine. I mean, I think there's an idea of it's a real it's really easy just to say, hey, doctor, whoever doctor you are, you have complete control of my health, or government or whatever it is versus saying, no, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm going to pursue wisdom, I'm going to pursue allowing myself to be educated from experts like you. And so yeah, so some people take a lot of time to change. Others, the teachable moment can you can switch on a dime. And knowing that something works is really important. The idea that you're worried that it doesn't work. The low carb or keto diet that we teach has been studied so much that it's like a prescription drug. I know that it will work if you do it. I mean, that's what I tell you when you come to the office, have no doubt that this will work. And the other thing that's surprising is it doesn't have to be difficult. So the approach that we use doesn't have unnecessary concern about macros or, or keto levels or, or seed oils even, because I think you get so little 
and the foods that we recommend. So knowing that it can be simple and sustainable as well, because a simple system is more sustainable than making it complicated. I don't know anyone who wants to check their ketone levels forever. So, you know, why not learn a method that doesn't really require that? Internet Keto today is a combination of what Mark Sisson has talked about, about Lauren Cordain, you heard that term, his name, the hunter-gatherer kind of approach, the primal approach, then you get into these products that were developed, and, and keto or low carb has been around even longer than that, although keto as a name started showing up on products only in the last few years. Be careful of those keto products. Always look at the total carbs on the label. You know, looking at the brand, just saying paleo or primal doesn't tell you how many carbs are in there. So if you're really trying to do a keto level prescription strength diet that reverses metabolic disease, you want to be really strict and very skeptical about any of these products, even the ones that, that Mark Sisson made. And I, I'm told that they changed some of the the variables, some of the ingredients to make it more available and, and shelf life stable. So eat as much as you can real foods that, that are not from the grocery store aisles where they're in boxes and bags. As a general theme, you'll be better off. You know, kind of looking at this whole set of talks together and, and this style, I, I really like the idea that there are a lot of ways to be healthy. There isn't one super food that you have to have or should have every day. And people who promote that is just they're selling food, selling a, a product. And the idea that there are many different ways to be healthy, eating something close to locally as possible for sustainability of the planet is another theme here that I don't always get into, but I think that's very important. If you're in a diabetes or weight loss phase, be careful to consider the source of the information in this video. But I have to hand it off to and, and applaud Dr. Josh Axe and Mark Sisson for making this information available and popularizing in a way that really has never been achieved before. It's never been easier to do a low carb or a keto diet than before. And it's thanks to these folks that it's so popular today. If you like this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell to get further videos. I have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Friday. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And check out AdapterLifeAcademy.com.